O God, the one with glory and goodness, polish my soul with the divine light of wisdom. Grant me the ability to feel gratitude for your blessings. Show me the truth as truth and inspire me to follow it. Show me the falsehood as falsehood and forbid me for believing and following it. Purify my soul of the clay of the hyle, because you are the primary cause. A city is a portion of territory inhabited by a community, an ummah. Whereas an Ummah is a portion of all people living in the developed regions of the earth. A city where people would rather gather to help each other in matters that will enable them to achieve real happiness is a virtuous city. Such communities are virtuous communities and such Ummahs are virtuous Ummahs. A virtuous world can only be possible if all Ummahs living in it would unite to reach happiness. More than 1,000 years ago, Al Farabi took the road from the steppes of Central Asia crossed the deserts and reached Baghdad. He developed a brand new thinking system by correlating the ancient philosophy legacy with the principle of Islamic value, based on the pure doctrine of divine oneness. This thinking system, which has entered on the notion of a strong civilization, has quickly progressed and extended to the entire Islamic geography. Therefore, he was given the title Mualim Sani, the second master after Aristotle. Al-Farabi is indeed a real philosopher, a real scholar of civilization and a man who made major contributions to all three civilizations, most primarily the ancient Greek philosophy. In other words, Al-Farabi is the person who enabled the induction of Aristotle and Plato to the Islamic world the two great philosophers who, by enriching it, formed the basis of philosophy in the philosophical movement which continues even today. With the majority of his works translated into Hebrew and Latin by Jewish and Christian interpreters, Al-Farabi was a great thinker. He made important contributions to the awakening of the Western world from its scholastic slumber to the formation of the Renaissance. Al-Farabi, who is the leading name in the philosophy of civilization with his works such as The Virtuous City, al Madina Al-Fadila, The Political Regime, Al-Siyasa Al-Madaniya, and Aphorisms of the Statesman, Usul Al-Madani, is one of the founders of modern political science. Farabi, evrensel bir filozoftur. Al-Farabi is a universal philosopher. He writes so perfectly that you cannot remove even a single sentence from his books. You cannot say it was unnecessary. But despite his universality, when, for instance, he builds the model of a virtuous city in al Madina al-Fadila, you can still see the Islamic colors and the Islamic spirit. For instance, he calls the actual ruler of Medina the supreme leader. His ideal supreme leader is both a philosopher and a prophet. These valleys between the two rivers that the Holy Scriptures describe as rivers flowing from Eden, Sirdarya, Sahun, and Amudarya, Jehun, were called the Mawara Unnahar in the Islamic world, which meant Fararud, namely, land beyond the river. The lands laying in the south of Aral Sea, in which Jehun flows, and falling on each side of the river towards northwest were called Khwarezm. The lands that stretched towards the west, towards the plains of Iran, were called Khorarsan, which means the place where the sun rises from. 
Since this region was at the intersection point of roads that led from the Great Wall of China to the Atlantic Ocean, and from the steppes of Russia to the Indian Ocean, it housed centers where a brand new shoot would always grow. With Kyrgyz steppes and Kuzulkum Desert on its right, and Ustyut Plateau and Karakum Desert on its left, the Jehun River, which branches out into hundreds of streams following over vast oceans of sand, was the lifeblood of Khwarezm region. The land of Khwarezm, which laid right in the middle of the Asian countries such as China, Iran and India. The Siberian steppes, southern Russia and Scandinavia was at the junction point of major roads that provided those countries a means of quick transport between each other. Hence, large caravans coming from those lands used to gather at Khwarezm and sell their hundreds of carloads of goods at the market. Spiritual places and science and culture centers were found in many cities in the Utrar, Ispijabi and Sidri regions of Kazakh Plateau. Those cities were Siganak, Siram, Jant, Kipchak, Arkok and Turkestan. These were the cities that bred many scientists for the Islamic civilization and the Turkic world. These lands which harbor all sorts of colors from the summits of snow-clad mountains to endless steeps, from hot deserts to cold and fresh-flowing rivers, and which generously display amazing historical and natural beauties. Those ravines crackled by the footsteps of Alexander the Great's Eastern Campaign. and these tombs covered by the spring in purple and white iris flowers had all become a rich basin of civilization where ancient cultures primarily the central asian chinese and indian civilizations and major faith groups such as buddhism hinduism zoroastrianism mazdeism and Manichaeism were nested in each other. These lands, which were the home of science and culture, did not only raise Muslim scholars. At different points, prominent representatives of religions such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Manichaeism, and Zoroastrianism were also brought up on these lands. Zarathustra, the founder of the ancient belief of Mazdaism, which still exists today, was born on these lands. Particularly with the coming of Islam, this region which kept the legacy of numerous cultures and civilizations had become one of the baskets in which also the Islamic science and thought were molded and shaped. Indeed, many Islamic scholars and philosophers who would leave their mark on the history were going to be raised here and open up to the world. When you review the Central Asian region, particularly the area that also includes Iran, you will see that it had first-class scientists. Some of these scholars' names are still alive in today's world. We call it algebra, right? Well, what is it? Obviously, it is a difficult field of study, and in Arabic, difficult means Jabir. This is Islamic civilization's eternal contribution to the civilization of the world. Unique sources of the sciences of philosophy, logic, medicine, astronomy, maths and algebra, but above all else, the sciences of Quran, Hadith and Fiqh were compiled on these lands. The first major dictionaries in Arabic and Turkish were also written here. The first great hermeneutic scholars such as Muqattil bin Suleiman, Buhran al-Din al-Nasafi, Imam i Buhari and Bukhara, as well as Hafiz such as Imam i Tirmidhi, Imam i Nasi and Darimi, who were his countrymen, were all to create their invaluable works on hadith on those lands as well. 
Founders of Islamic theology were raised in the parts. Great pioneers of the science of hadith, distinguished representatives of the science of fiqh, leading names of the Hanafi sect and great representatives of the principles of Islamic belief were all born, raised and developed here and spread to the Islamic world. Scholars such as Fakhreddin Razi have penned their monumental works of Islamic science of Im al Khalim here on these lands. This was also the place where the Islamic Sufi tradition was first developed. Many of the first Sufis from Ibrahim bin Edhem to Bayezid Bastami, from Waz er Razi to Sakik i Behli, were all born and bred in this region. And these lands did not only bring up Islamic scholars, hundreds of scientists studying hard science were also to scatter around the world from this region too. And they were to submit science to the service of all humanity as the common legacy of the entire world, not as something to be used to sustain the rule of certain circles in the society. Avicenna, who was born in the village of Afshan near Bukhara, made a name for himself at around the age of 18 when he treated the Samanid ruler, Nuh ibn Mansur. Avicenna compiled his thousands of pages long canon of medicine focusing on the treatment of the body and his equally massive work on the treatment of the mind and the soul, the book of healing on the lands. The new paradigm he developed for the synthesis of Aristotelian science and philosophy, Euclidean geometry, Ptolemaic astronomy and Galenic medicine was honored with a massive recognition all around the world for almost 800 years. To whom the greatest historian of science in the 20th century, Sarton, has dedicated a century in his book. The history of science, the unrivaled scholar Abu Rehun al-Biruni had written his immortal works on medicine, pharmacology, maths, astronomy, geology, and the history of religions here too. Al-Khwarizmi, who gave his name to the science of logarithm, founded the science of algebra on these lands. Abdul Hamid ibn Turk solved mathematical equations here. Al-Fargani, who is also known as Al-Fraganus in Latin, mapped the sky here. Jibr ibn Hayyan noticed the irresistible charm of alchemy here. Abu Masar el-Behi followed his footsteps. Taberi laid the foundations of writing the history of Islam, and Ibn Hafkar, the art of being a geographer, also on these lands. Recently, an American anthropologist has noticed that there were not many works on this region. He is not an expert in the field, but still, using other works as his resources, he has written a large book. The title of his book is very interesting, The Legacy We Lost. Indeed, we are still writing the history of the Islamic civilization, but it is focused on the Middle East. Maybe we delve into Africa a little or Spain, but we still fail to do justice to the Central Asia in terms of its place in the history of civilization. This is why we do not have enough information on Al-Farabi, for instance. Al-Jahwari wrote the first major dictionary of the Arabic language and Mahmud al-Kashkari of the Turkish language here. In his work, Kutad Gubilig Yusuf Has Hajib laid the foundations of the Turkish state philosophy here. Farid Uddin Athar tried to decipher the conference of birds here. Saadi in his work Flower Garden, Gulistan, and Hafiz in his work Divan articulated their experiences of culture of tolerance and living together, which was blossoming on these lands. The Sultan of all scholars, Mahlana Jalal ad-Din Rumi, the son of Bahaddin Veled, who migrated from the region of Khwarezm, current town of Karaman, then known as Larend in the Greek-Roman lands, wrote the Masnavi, the saga of love and immortality. The great mystic Hodja Ahmed Yesevi wrote his Divan i Hikmet, the Book of Wisdom, which inspired the nomadic Highlander Turkish tribes to aspire to govern the whole world here. 
Haji Bektash Veli and the Khorasan saints who followed in the steps of Hoja Ahmed Yesevi carried this unique sense of tolerance that had blossomed in Turkestan to Anatolia and Rumelia, which have become a mosaic of different civilizations, cultures and beliefs. In short, these lands had introduced to the world numerous scientists and scholars who have opened up entire humanity's horizon. Khorasan and Mawaran Nahr region have always been the domains to which the Abbasid Caliphates attach great importance, because that area was the starting point of events which led to the foundation of Abbasid Empire and the fall of Umayyad Caliphate. The great uprising started by Abu Muslim from Khorasan who grew up on these lands resulted in the foundation of Abbasid Empire and therefore these places were particularly important for the Abbasids. Caliphate Emin and Memun gave a semi-independent status to the Samani family who were governors of the region. Karluk, Yagma and Chigil Turks, who fought beside the Muslims in the Battle of Talas in 1751, collectively adopted Islam. Shortly after that, they ended the Samani rule and founded the Karakhanid state, which is the first Turkish state in history. Around the time Al-Farabi was born, the religion of Islam was fairly new to the region and among the Turkic people. Cities in the south of Kazakhstan, in the Turkestan region such as Taraz, Balasagun, Sairam, also known as Ispijab, Yesi, Shaimkent and Chach, which is known as Tashkent today, had rapidly developed and become a center of religion and culture where new Muslim Turkic tribes learnt and proselytized the religion of Islam. Utrar, which was established on the spacious and fertile plains right next to the Sridara, namely Sehun River, where Al-Farabi was born and bred, had quickly become one of the most important military garrisons of Central Asia on the Silk Road, with its fortified castle, Ulu Mosque, which is also called the Friday Mosque, markets, bazaars and baths. Old Utrar had a very significant status on the Silk Road. We do not know the exact date of Muhammad ibn Tahran ibn Uzlug al-Farabi, the son of Ebu Nasr Muhammad, the commander of the Utra castle, who was also responsible for the safety of the city. Some sources cite that he was born in 871 in the village of Vesik, which is 70 kilometers to the city of Utrar. Please. Many different handicrafts, ornaments, ironworks, firearms and irritation tools from Utrar have survived until today. Recorded handicrafts include local ones as well as foreign keepsakes, which were brought in by caravans coming from other countries. Al-Farabi had his childhood in this region bestowed with the legacies of a well-rooted, rich and big civilizations. Traces of all these civilizations can easily be seen in the formation of his rich vision. At the beginning of the Silk Road, Confucianist, Taoist and Shintoist culture predominant in China was very common. In Central Asia, Buddhism that came from India was very dominant. Manichaeism, Zoroastrianism and Mazdaism were very influential in areas towards Khwarezm, Mahwara un Nahr and Khorasan. Around the 5th century, a small group of Nestorian Christians who fled Byzantium had also taken shelter in this region. The Silk Road, which has been completely within the field of Islamic culture as of the 8th century, was not only receiving major trade caravans, but also hosting the sacred places of different religions and cultures. Places of significant importance for Zoroastrianism were located in Khwarezm and Azerbaijan. 
particularly the Fergana Valley, house the sacred places of many religions. Al-Farabi had a good education in the city he was born in and started to learn Arabic and Persian along with his mother tongue Turkish, which were the common languages of science and culture of the Islamic world back in those days. One day, as his teacher was tutoring Al-Farabi, a Buddhist, a Mazdias, and a Shamus priest and an Assyrian priest who were in Bukhara came to the Madrasa and discussed the local people's cultures, religions, and civilizations with his teacher. Al-Farabi carefully watched their discussions and after they had left asked his teacher how he could learn more about the subjects that they had been discussing. His teacher told him that Baghdad, the capital of the caliphate, was actually the center to learn about these subjects and assured him that he could send Al-Farabi to Baghdad after he had completed his education there. Afterwards, Al-Farabi leaves Utra to further deepen his knowledge and travel to Bukhara. Bukhara, which is the famous historian of Islam es Salibi, defined as home of the great castle of domain, summit of the science and the big agora, where contemporary scholars met, was located in the lower basin of the Zarafshan River, whose name meant the spreader of gold. As told by En Narsahi, when Al-Farabi came to Bukhara, the city was just consisting of the castle, town and outer district. There was a Registan Agora at the center of the city, which was surrounded by city walls, with only two main doors to enter. The door in the east was called Gurian, and the one in the west was called Sehle. Cotton clothes, carpets, prayer rugs, twilled in Bukhara were sent all around the world through the Silk Road. The city that thrived under Tahiri, Samanid, Buyid, and Ghaznavid rule had become the most important culture and science center of the region, particularly under the rule of Samanid. The library called the Siwan al-Hikmah, namely the storehouse of wisdom which was built by the famous Samanid ruler Nur ibn Mansur, was an important center of culture and art where the richest works of the time were stored, maintained and submitted to the use of competent people. Shortly after Al-Farabi left the city, famous doctor and philosopher Avicenna, who was born in a nearby town of Afsham and completed his study in Bukhara, had retreated Nuh ibn Mansur. Avicenna had toiled at the Siwan al-Hikmah library in Bukhara for long years and studied the sources of the works he was going to write. Chronicles talk about rumors spread by people who were jealous of Avicenna, purporting that he stole the books at the library and wrote his name on them, then burned down the library so that no one would ever notice what he did. Bukhara, which was controlled by pagan Karahitais for a while, was completely destroyed after the Mongolian invasion. It is said that Al-Farabi, who moved to Samarkand from Bukhara, had stayed there for some time to improve his knowledge and experience. Samarkand, the city of Al-Fartunga, who is known as Efresiab in Islamic sources and for whom many legends were told, was first conquered by one of the famous commanders of the Umayyads, Qutaybe ibn Muslim, along with Muslims, Buddhists, and Zoroastrists, there are Jews and Christians living in Samarkand as well. Although Samarkand, which grew under the rule of Karakhanid and Selchuks, was made the capital of Khwarazm Shah Muhammad, it had suffered great damages from the Mongolian invasion. Samarkand, which was defined by Ibn Hafkal as the port of Mawara un Nahr, had brought up thousands of scientists. Among these, great scholars of Islam, Imam Maturidi, who identified the doctrines of the Hanafiya sect, was the most prominent one. Al Farabi left Samarkand after a short while as well and traveled to Merv through Beh. <laughs> Al-Farabi, who was en route to Baghdad, came to Merv after Bukhara and Samarkand. 
Mev was an old city where Christian, Buddhist and Manichaeist culture livened up and became widespread. Therefore, Al-Farabi did not stay there long. But at least during that time, he had the opportunity to get to know the cultures of his time well. The scholar who travelled from Merv to Berg must have taken good advantage of the old Buddhist temples and Buddhist culture in Berg. The fact that he had known and seen those cultures truly had an effect on his future world vision. The main objective of Al-Farabi, who had the opportunity to get to know the ancient Chinese, Indian and Central Asian cultures and civilizations on the Silk Road, was to go to Mesopotamia, the birthplace of universal civilizations, and to Baghdad, the capital of the Islamic Caliphate and the center of Islamic science and thought.